Hello everyone, you are listening to the Bible in a Lifetime podcast. Starting with the Gospel according to John, we'll dive deeper verse by verse using multiple translations to glean some insights. And if there's enough interest, after John's Gospel, we'll continue by reading some of the other books of the Bible. This is going to be more in-depth and as such, a lot slower. It could take an entire lifetime. So how about we just get started and see where it takes us. The beginning of the Gospel according to John in the NRSV. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Alright, so let's stop there. The word was, W-A-S, is used here three times for different purposes. In the beginning was the Word, to emphasize the pre-existence of Christ. The New Living Translation clarifies this by rendering it this way. In the beginning the Word already existed. So John here is highlighting the fact that the Word was not just there at the beginning in time and space, but he is emphasizing the eternal nature of Jesus Christ, existing before all creation. John also begins his Gospel with this opening to call to mind the Genesis story of creation, the very first words of the entire Bible. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the Word was. Next, John says the Word was with God, to emphasize the relationship of Jesus Christ to the Father. Here, the Knox translation uses the word abiding. God had the Word abiding with Him. So Jesus was abiding with the Father. It points to such a close relationship, an undivided, loving unity. Lastly, John says the Word was God. In Greek, this is a predication, not an identification. So John already emphasized the undivided unity of Jesus and the Father. But here, he is emphasizing a different aspect. He is not identifying Jesus as God the Father, but saying that Jesus is all that which makes the Father God. Everything that God is, the Word is. They are one, yet two. This is why we say in the Nicene Creed that Jesus is true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. That is to say, all the qualities and properties that make God God, Jesus Christ has as an eternal, inextricable attribute. This is how the Athanasian Creed puts it, quote, We worship one God in the Trinity, and the Trinity in unity. We distinguish among the persons, but we do not divide the substance. The Father is a distinct person, the Son is a distinct person, and the Holy Spirit is a distinct person. Still the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have one divinity, equal glory, and co-eternal majesty. End quote. I think oftentimes we emphasize the unity and oneness of God so that we don't fall into heresy. But sometimes we go too far and completely erase the persons of the Trinity. We should avoid this lest we fall into the modalism heresy, or what sometimes is called oneness Christology, which denies the Holy Trinity. In modalism, the Father and the Son are merely manifestations of one person, like how a man can be a father and a son and an uncle, etc. In this heresy, the Son is merely Son because of the Incarnation, but John makes clear in this intro to his Gospel that the Divine Logos, the Word, Jesus Christ, and by extension the Holy Trinity, was from the very beginning, eternally existing, not merely distinct because of manifestations, but distinct because of persons and relationship in the Godhead. Even without the Incarnation, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Triune God, existed from all eternity and forever. Let's continue reading. Verse 3. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. Here we are reminded that all things, that, that is all creation, from the heavens to the earth, from angels to animals, were created through God's Word, through Jesus Christ. I like how John emphasizes in the second part that without Him not one thing came into being. It's almost like he's saying that it's utterly impossible in the divine process of creation to do it without God's Word. Let's continue reading. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. Jesus gives us life. 
In many ways, we are like animals. We are very earthly creatures. How our bodies have developed, everything about the unconscious structures that make up our bodies point to us being, for lack of a better word, earthlings. But what makes us so different from the rest of earthly creation is that divine life within us, the breath of God, the word of God that animates us, that gave us consciousness and reason and the ability to have complex relationships with each other and with God. Jesus not only gave us life to animate us, but infused us with an eternal soul, making us rational creatures capable of loving him. And this life within us is the life of Christ, the divine life that we get a share in, the life of Christ which is the light of all people. And as we continue to read in verse 5, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Such is the divine light, that no darkness can overcome it, or extinguish it, as the New Living Translation says. Darkness can't even comprehend it, as the Dewey Ream says. As you may remember from science class, darkness is not a thing in and of itself. Rather, it is an absence of light. And so darkness here, representing evil and sin, and alienation from God, is not a force opposite to God, but rather darkness is absence of God's light. Evil is a corruption of good. Spiritual darkness can never overcome the light. It can't even understand it. This reminds me of what we'll hear later in the Gospel about how Satan had put into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. This darkness was in the Judas heart and in the hearts of the leaders and crowd who demanded that Christ be crucified. They couldn't see. They were so far away from the light that they couldn't see the goodness of the cross and the salvation that was wrought through it. The light is so incomprehensible that Satan thought he was winning. Sin and death thought it had won on Friday. It didn't understand the light and couldn't overcome it. But rather, as we saw on Sunday morning, the life overcame death. Light overcame darkness. The love of Christ overcame sin. And because of Christ, we are more capable than ever to know God, to transcend mere earthly consciousness and live the divine life of the kingdom of God. Let's continue with verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. This idea of being sent means that John had a divine mission, as the last and greatest prophet heralding the coming of Christ. He was sent as a representative of all prophets past who testified about the coming of the light, and as we'll see, this theme of testimony, of bearing witness to the light, will run throughout this gospel. Not only do the scriptures and past prophets testify about Jesus, but his works, his miracles, the people he encounters, the lives he changes, the Holy Spirit within us that comes from the Father testifies of Christ. Verse 8. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. Here John makes clear the Baptist's role is subordinate to Jesus. By the time Christ began his ministry, John the Baptist had already had many followers and had made such an uproar that he got noticed by those in authority and was beheaded. Certainly people knew him, and we hear in the gospel how many people still believed in him as a great prophet. And so he was. But John the Evangelist is reminding them that if you liked John the Baptist, you're gonna love Jesus. Because John's whole ministry was to point to Christ and prepare his way so that people might be prepared to follow Jesus. I wonder how we can be little John the Baptist in our lives, clearing the way for people and making it easier for them to follow Jesus. Just a thought to ponder. Let's continue with verse 9. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Again, we are reminded of how Christ enlightens us, gives us reason, 
the ability to be rational creatures and to know the truth, to know goodness, to know him. Every good thing we do is because of that light of Christ which enlightens us, inherent in our humanity, which witnesses to God, for we are images of God. Let's continue. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. Here we are reminded that, despite the fact that we are images of God, and reason gives us the ability to know God, we often reject him, and as such reject our truth. Israel had a covenant with God, and as such a close relationship and divine gifts, but many of them rejected Christ. We who are baptized into the new covenant must also consider how often we too reject God and his divine gifts. Do we allow Christ to transform us? Are we docile instruments of the Holy Spirit? Do we nurture the gifts of the Spirit that have been given to us at our baptism and confirmation? They are there already within us, able to work through us if we are willing, if we stop rejecting Him and start knowing Him and accepting Him. We must remember that God is always faithful. God is ever merciful. He is there waiting for us to love Him back because he has never stopped loving us. We are children of God, born into a new life in Christ. And how is this possible? Well, because as we hear in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. God, our Creator, became part of creation when before He dwelt with His people in many and various ways, in the wilderness tabernacles or in the temples. Now He came to surpass all those ways, and He dwelt among us as a man, Jesus of Nazareth. The Incarnation marked a new phase for humanity, a humanity reinvigorated, a renewed humanity, a humanity that could no longer fight against God because we became inextricably united to Him, because He who transcends all creation, who created all things, Christ, the King of the universe, gave up His divine privileges, and He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being and appeared in human form humbling himself to the Father, so that all creation might benefit, and we may become children of God.